So today's speaker is Susan Reed, and she is the sister of Jerry Mock, and you already know she was the first woman to fly solo around the world. Susan's a retired teacher and school librarian. We've already been talking about, I've been boasting about her beautiful library to her. Um, she holds a Bachelor of Education degree from Ohio University and a Master of Library Science degree from Kent State University. And in addition to relating her sister's story, she also researches and does presentations about women throughout the history of aviation, as the specifically focusing on World War II um, aviators um, who helped with the war effort. And I love to read about those, those ladies too, so we have that in common. Susan's an avid reader, that's no surprise. Uh, she's a gardener, a golfer, she volunteers in a theater, and she's an active member of PEO, which is an organization that helps women reach for the stars through higher education. And um, she has two daughters, two granddaughters, and two cats. <laughs> Susan Reed. She forgot to say that my cats are both beautiful. And my, and, and, and my granddaughters also. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. I love talking mm -hmm. about my sister. Um, actually, she was about an inch shorter than me, but I always looked up to her. <laughs> she was also 15 years older than me, so she left for college when I was two. I got to know her when I grew up, and I got to fly with her in the plane that went around the world before they put in all the fuel tanks. They had to take out my seat. My favorite trivia question, wherever I go, is who was the first woman to make a solo flight around the world? Well, of course, almost everybody says Amelia Earhart. Even pilots, even women pilots, they just don't know. But of course, back in 1937, Amelia, with her navigator, Fred Noonan, disappeared while they were attempting a flight around the world. Because of the unsolved mystery of her disappearance, her name is still very much alive, and people still think about her. They just forgot that she did not complete that big flight. But 27 years after her attempt, my sister, Jerry Mock, became the first woman to make a solo flight around the world, and that, that's a big distinction. She flew an 11-year-old single-engine Cessna, and she named it the Spirit of Columbus because she lived in Bexley, Columbus area, and flew out of Port Columbus. She always called it her plane Charlie because you know, the, and she wrote a book called 38 Charlie, a name for the tail number of her plane. A plane is registered just like a car, and so when a tower controller or another pilot or anyone would be talking to a pilot, they would use the tail number. So it was 38 Charlie, or as she said, the two of them did this little adventure. When Jerry was about seven years old, she had a ride in a Ford tri-motor airplane. She was so excited. She, when the flight landed, she said to my parents, when I grow up, I'm going to be a pilot, okay? And I'm going to fly around the world. And she said, Daddy sort of patted her on the head and said, well, that's nice, dear. But when she was studying about all these countries in school, she, she was fascinated and she told all of her friends, I'm going to be a pilot. I'm going to fly around the world. I want to see the pyramids. I want to ride a camel. And they looked at her like, oh yeah, sure, you know. But some of them, when she made her flight, were at the airport when she returned with a big sign, Welcome Home Jerry, class of 1943. So she had her dream. My mother was a Wright, and we already always knew that somewhere distantly we were related to the Wright brothers. She knew she was gonna do this, but she just didn't realize she would be making history. She had never been a typical housewife, and um, okay, um, pictures of where or when she was young, or okay. Um, in the fifties, she co-produced a TV show called Youth Has It Say. She was a gourmet cook, an author, a musician, and a student of the opera. One evening in December of 1962, as Jerry and Russ, her husband, were having dinner, 
she talked about how bored she was. You know, you cook dinner and it takes a lot longer to fix it and clean up than it does to eat it. She uh, Russ said, well, if you're so bored with your life, why don't you just get on a plane and fly around the world? She said, all right, I will. I mean, this had always been in the back of her mind. They co-owned a plane with a gentleman in Columbus, and she asked Hal, would it be all right if I take our plane on a little flight around the world? He said, oh, no, that's fine. She realized he thought she was kidding. Well, she wasn't. Um, the rest is history. It took nearly two years of planning. Um, at the time, there were no overseas operators of corporate and personal planes because only airlines and the military were flying internationally. Flight planning agencies did not exist, and her flight planning was done mostly using a Rand McNally globe. She had um, some help from um, General Lassiter at the Air Force Base in Columbus area. He helped set up some of the countries in her path, but she did the planning basically herself, and it was quite a feat. At the time of the flight, Jerry had only logged 750 hours, which is not very much. She'd been flying part-time for seven years. She reserved her, received her instrument rating just before the trip. She made her first ever solo instrument approach with only one quarter mile visibility, lower than most airlines land in today. She had never flown further than the Bahamas. In order for the flight to be an official record, the NAA, the National Aeronautic Association, had observers who would literally lie on the ground, look up at her and say, look up and say, she flew over me at this time, at this date, at this location. The extra seats had to be taken out of the plane uh, so that we could make room for the aluminum gas tanks to have enough gasoline to, to go across the ocean. The um, people wondered why she used, uh, flew a Cessna 180. Well, that's what they had. Also, she had researched and found that the Cessna 180 could take off with anything you could get the doors closed on. So it was a very good choice. Like cars, planes have to be registered. Her registration was, well, by the way, the, the picture that you just saw, now that was actually a different plane that she flew, but that shows you what, what the fuel tanks look like with, with the seat for her. And then you can see how tiny the plane is. There's not room for anything but one little seat and one very short girl. Her plane, hers um, was, of course, November 153880. One, November 38, Charlie. This was the tail number of the plane, and in order for anybody to have contact with her, it was always 38 Charlie, back and forth. Okay? Um, while making plans, she was featured in a lot of um, newspaper articles about her intentions, but back in 1964, uh, society and the press, they didn't know quite what to ask her. I mean, women didn't do things like this. Um, forget that she would be embarking on a dangerous 23,000 mile flight, surrounded by 178 gallons of explosive gasoline. They were interested in what she would be wearing. Since there was no room in the plane for a big suitcase, she had one very small suitcase and explained that she would be wearing drip dry clothes that she could rinse out at night and put on the next day. Imagine her horror when she found one of the headlines was, Housewife Jerry Mock to circle the globe in drip dries. <laughs> well, but she determined to look like a lady. This picture, where, okay was taken of her just before she left on the flight. I had just handed her that cup of coffee. Had no idea that cup of coffee would be known forever. Uh, notice under the blue coat, she was wearing a blue skirt and jacket. White blouse, pearl necklace, hose and heels. She was going to look like a lady, and she did. So when I do my talks, I dress as much like her as I can. 
We have a museum in Newark, Ohio, where we grew up, and there is an exhibit of her there uh, with a plane that looks identical to her and the clothes that she wore on the flight, including those high-heeled shoes. Joan Miriam Smith, a pilot from California, saw the articles, and she announced that she was going to fly around the world, and she would finish first. She was a, actually a flight instructor and had thousands of, mile, of miles of aviation experience, and so she was a natural. She'd always thought about doing it and thought, well, if she was going to be first, she had to do it now. Thus, Jerry's plans for a leisurely flight around the world became a bit of a race. Joan left two days before Jerry. Though mechanical problems eventually scuttled the flight for Joan, the race meant that Jerry couldn't take the time to see the world the way she had wanted to. Finally, Lloyds of London approved to, uh, <coughs> they did not want to have anything to do with her because they, they thought they would lose their money. It was too da dangerous a flight. But at last, Jerry in her red and white Cessna 180 was ready to fly. She was 38 years old, married, the mother of three children, a little girl not quite four, and two teenage boys. Russ's mother, a widow, stayed at the home to take care of Russ and the kids. And on March 19, 1964, Jerry flew out of Port Columbus at 9.31 in the morning. A few minutes later, while she was still climbing to 7,500 feet, she heard what the controller was saying, whose voice was being broadcast to all of us on the ground. Well, I guess that's the last we'll ever see from her. Well, along the 19 legs of her adventure, Jerry faced daily challenges that would test any pilot. On the first day, she was not airborne long before she realized that the long-range radio was not working. What could she do? Go home? She thought about the crowds back home in Columbus and of her sponsors who had risked their money on her. They believed in her and she did not want to let them down. So settling down, to trying to relax, she went on to, hunt to Bermuda, her first stop, which was 700 miles away. Landing in Bermuda was stressful. Extra heavy gusts of wind whipped at the tail of the plane. On the ground, taxiing to the terminal building, she realized that the left brake was not working. This sent her into a series of 360 degree circles before finally getting it under control. New brake assemblies were supposed to have been mounted on Charlie prior to departure, but in the rush to keep up with Smith's surprise early launch, her crew set her off without the new brake and they forgot to tell her. Didn't take long to figure it out. The weather in Bermuda and over the Atlantic was so stormy that Jerry had to remain there from the 19th to the 25th of March. Even commercial flights were being held up, but at least she had a chance to relax and do a little bit of sightseeing. The radio men there had an opportunity to work on the malfunctioning radio, but they had to completely remove all the fuel tanks in order to do it. As it turned out, the main wire to the antenna motor had been disconnected and taped off. I remember seeing the picture of the wire and this big piece of tape. Obviously, it was never going to work. This, of course, led to the thought that foul play had been at work, but there was no way to prove it. Now, she talked to the men and said, now, when they're putting the tanks back in, I'll show you how to do this. And they looked at her and said, lady, you may be the pilot, but we're the mechanics, we can handle this. Well, finally they came to her and said, uh, would you mind showing us in what order we need to do this? So, sort of a man thing, I guess. But um, a few years ago, uh, after all this, I knew I had heard about another possible bit of sabotage. The day before she left, on the ground, Russ, a pilot, was just double-checking all the controls, and when he revved up the engine on the ground, oil started pouring out of the oil filter. Now, either they forgot to put in the new oil filter as planned, or somebody removed the new one and put in an old one that was ready to explode. If, if he had not done this on the ground, it would have blown up in the air and she would have died. 
I used to say it took a lot of courage for her to do this flight. When I found out about that, I thought, no, it took a lot of guts. Can you imagine? Well, anyway, she did it. Finally, on March 26th, Jerry had a window of opportunity when the storms subsided a bit, and a new storm was brewing, and it was time to leave Bermuda while she could. The Cessna's cabin tanks were now full of gas, and the plane weighed almost 3,400 pounds, a lot more than the 2,500 pounds that it was normally licensed for. Her ferry permit from the U.S. Federal Aviation Agency made the flight legal, but not necessarily safe. She had no way of dumping fuel, and if she were to take off and discover that a radio or something did not work, it would be dangerous for her to attempt a landing until several hours worth of fuel was burned off. She was always very careful to check and double check each instrument. She finally announced to the tower that November 1538 Charlie was ready for takeoff for her 2200 mile flight over water to Santa Maria in the Azores. Out about the middle of the ocean, Jerry noticed that the plane seemed to be slowing up and she was losing altitude. After checking everything in the plane, she had a very frightening thought, ice. She turned her flashlight beep on the strut outside her door and found about an inch of ice clinging to the leading edge of the strut. Undoubtedly, at least that much ice or more would be on the wings. Cessna 180s had no de-icing equipment as they were not supposed to be flying in these conditions. She knew she had to climb to a higher altitude to get above the clouds, but first she had to get clearance. <coughs> she had just passed into Santa Maria's flight information region, so she radioed them. As I told you, she wrote a book. I know she wrote it herself because I helped edit it. I'd like to read a few things in, from the book because I want you to picture you in that plane with her. Santa Maria, this is November 1538, Charlie, over. A few seconds passed. I was ready to try again when an acknowledgement came over the loudspeaker. He must have been having a coffee break. November 1538, Charlie, this is Santa Maria Radio. Go ahead. Santa Maria, November 1538, Charlie, has ice, wing ice. Request clearance to flight to a high le flight level of 110. I tried to speak slowly and distinctly so he could understand. November 1538, Charlie, please repeat. Santa Maria, November 1538, Charlie has ice. Request flight level 110. Repeat, ice. Request flight level 110. November 1538, Charlie, this is Santa Maria. Unless you uh, understand that you have ice and you're requesting flight level 110. Is that affirmative? Affirmative, affirmative. 3-8 Charlie, please stand by one minute. I pushed in the throttle some more and swung the flashlight beep over the strut. Now the ice was thicker. How much? An inch? An inch and a half? How much ice could Charlie carry and still climb up to 11,000 feet? At any rate, a lot of the fuel had been burned off, at least 400 pounds, that should help to compensate from the, for the weight of the ice, but ice also could change the shape of the oil foil, foil and cause the plane to become uncontrollable. But hurry, hurry, Santa Maria. The one minute I was supposed to stand by dragged into several. I picked up the mic. Santa Maria, Santa Maria, November 1538, Charlie, request flight level 110. I have ice. 38, Charlie, this is Santa Maria, please stand by. Santa Maria, please hurry. I can't hold on to too much longer. I knew the controller was be checking for other planes that would be in the area flying at 11,000 feet, but surely he must know that the, my plane could stay indefinitely at 9,000 feet with ice. And if he didn't give me clearance soon, the plane could start down of its own accord. I looked out at the struts again. There was at least twice as much ice as had been there when I first found it. If the controller didn't give me clearance soon, I would have to try to get above the clouds anyway, even without permission, while the plane could still do it. Finally, the controller gave her permission. 
to climb to flight level 110. Eventually, she was able to make a safe landing in Santa Maria, where a large crowd of people greeted her. This was one of the most memorable stops of her trip. She visited the small church where in 1493, Christopher Columbus had stopped. Santa Maria to Casablanca, March 28th. A little over 24 hours after landing in Santa Maria, Jerry took off for Casablanca. This would take her about five and a half hours. But after a couple of hours, she realized the airspeed again was beginning to drop, and she knew that ice again was forming on the struts. She immediately called for permission to change altitude, and again it took several minutes for the controller to give her the clearance to climb. She realized it was just routine to him, but he wasn't several hundred miles at sea. Casa Blanca, Casa Blanca, March 29th. She got a good night's sleep and intended to take off the next morning, but bad weather reports kept her grounded for another day. It was Easter and she had a relaxing day, enjoying the city and being entertained. Russ called Jerry every time she landed. And every time he called, he urged her to hurry. He'd take off, you know, it'll be fine, don't worry, everything's gonna be great, just you cannot let Joan catch you. Joan never did, of course, but he called every time. And finally, she said at one time, if you call me one more time about Joan, I'm gonna come, get a, come home at a commercial plane. <laughs> she said, yeah, she was five feet tall. So, small statue very strong spirit. She was there, she knew what the conditions were, and she wasn't going to let anybody else tell her what to do. Jerry started on her flight to Bowen, Algeria uh, on March 30th, after carefully consulting with the weather people. Some 900 miles away, she would be flying about six hours. This was an uneventful flight. After getting the plane bedded down for the night, the one English-speaking person at the airport offered to drive her to a hotel. She had no French money, and the man at the hotel said he could not take her American money and would not take her $10 American Express check. The banks were closed, but the English-speaking man said, well, she had to have French francs. So he offered to pay her bill and eat money for the restaurant. He would trade her American money for that. But he said, you cannot tell anybody because I could be put in jail if I did this. Now this seems so strange today because you can go in any bank and get money for whatever country, but it was different back in 1964. Bone to Tripoli, March 31st, 418 miles. Filing an international flight plan and getting Char Charlie cleared to leave was always complicated. She attempted to file her flight plan to Cairo, but everyone insisted that first she should stop in Tripoli. She was assured that the sandstorms in Tripoli were nothing to worry about. Well, she wasn't happy about any sandstorms, never hearing of any good ones. But finally she agreed and to the plan to fly to Tripoli and she was cleared for takeoff. After a short while, all traces of civilization below were replaced by the grim desolation of the Sahara. Every few minutes, Jerry scanned the instrument panel to be sure that everything was running smoothly. On one check, she noticed that the antenna to the high frequency radio had unreeled. This switch controlled the electric antenna motor by her left knee, and apparently when she scrambled into the, wiggled into the plane, she must have accidentally kicked this. So she flipped a switch to reel in the antenna and promptly forgot about it. As she flew along, she daydreamed about the camel caravans, the tribes of the Malik, of the nomadic Arabs, and again in her words, suddenly my reverie was broken. I caught a whiff of something burning. Quickly, the odor became stronger, the acrid odor of burning insulation. My brain raced, the motor to the high frequency radio. I had forgotten to turn it off. My hand found the switch and turned off the motor that had been grinding away trying to pull in a wire that was already taut. That motor, that burning antenna motor, was just inches from the big tank. The big tank, half filled with high octane aviation gas and half filled with even more volatile fumes. The airplane could blow up at any second.
Charlie and I would be scattered in little pieces over the Libyan desert. Nothing would ever be found. No one would ever know what happened to us. Were sparks behind the tank? Was the wire burning? Even if I had been able to move, there was no way to see behind the tanks. How much heat could the aluminum tank absorb before the mixture of gas and fumes would blow? What should I do? What could I do? Panic is a wild thing that paralyzes the thinking part of the brain and stimulates involuntary reactions. I thought of crazy things. If I had had a parachute, I probably would have jumped. I thought of landing the Cessna in the sand. That would have been sure disaster, but I was too scared to realize that if the plane were to go up in flames, it wouldn't wait till I was on the ground. A hard landing could trigger an explosion, or the tanks might rupture, pouring fuel over hot metal and turning the airplane into a deadly hell of flames. Jerry gave thought to radioing for help. She gave her in giving her position, but she didn't dare cut, t touch the switch to see if the trailing antenna would unwind, and without it, she couldn't be heard by anyone. Reason told her that the only thing to do would be to sit quietly and let the scorching metal cool. Praying, she tried to relax. Finally, the smell of burning wire and insulation went away. She thanked God for saving her from panic, which could have caused her to do something really stupid. It was a beautiful day again. Visibility was good, and she was able to see Tripoli and make a smooth landing. She spent the night at the Libya Palace Hotel next to the King's Palace. She took pictures of the King's um, satin pajamas, red, or drying on the line, but somehow that film never made it back home. <laughs> Tripoli to Cairo, April 1st, 1,090 miles, 7 hours, 10 minutes. Cairo, about 900 nautical miles. Uh, she wanted to get there before dark, so she got up at 4.30 a.m. There was so much red tape before takeoff, Charlie had been fueled and everything seemed to be going smoothly for a change. Finally, she found the immigration man asking him to sign her visa to go to Cairo. He impatiently told her he was busy, it wasn't time for the next plane, she should come back later. She grabbed his arm, pointed to Charlie, and insisting that her plane was there and ready. He finally understood what she'd been trying to tell him. It was 8 o'clock, remember she got there, got up at 4.30? It was 8 o'clock when she climbed into the plane. When she pushed the starter button, nothing happened. A mechanic decided the problem was the starter solenoid. This happened to be the one spare part that she had brought with her. But where was it? It could be hidden at any one of the corners into which little tiny things could be squeezed. Everything had to be removed from the plane. But finally the solenoid was found and installed and she was airborne for <coughs> Egypt. As she neared Cairo, Jerry called the tower, reported her position, and estimated time of arrival. A few minutes later, approach control called and asked if she had 3A Charlie, uh, if 3A Charlie had the airport in sight. This surprised her, not thinking that she was that close. At first, all she could see was desert, and then sure enough, there was an airport dead ahead about 10 miles. The tower controller said that 3A Charlie should make her approach for runway five. She was happy to hear a clear voice with an almost American sounding voice. She called the tower, reporting that 3A Charlie was down time, downwind on runway five. Again, the tower controller told her to continue her approach. She relaxed and tried to ignore the vague feeling that something wasn't quite right. Suddenly, my reverie was broken. Sorry. The wheels of the plane touched down the runway just as the voice of the controller came through the loudspeaker. 3A Charlie, what is your present position? Well, 3A Charlie is on the ground. But even as I answered, I knew that something really was wrong. Yes, something definitely was wrong. Things were happening so fast I wasn't quite sure what to do, but I saw a taxiway off to the left and decided to get the plane off the runway while I figured out the situation. 
The tower controller and I called to each other as Charlie turned onto the taxiway. At the same second, three trucks full of soldiers careened from around a corner, raced toward her, and slammed to a stop within inches of Charlie, blocking my way. Guns in hand, the soldiers leaped for the trucks surrounding the airplane. They looked as if they meant business, although no one actually pointed a gun at me. I guess I didn't look like too dangerous an invader. One of the men signaled to me to shut off the engine. I decided I had better see what these men wanted and where I was. I shut down Charlie's engine and opened the door. The officer in charge said, in good English, he must have seen the American flag on Charlie's tail. Madam, you are not in Cairo. What do you mean I'm not in Cairo? I may have the wrong airport, but I knew I had the right city. Madam, you're not in Cairo. Okay, if I'm not in Cairo, then where am I? Here, show me on this map. I shoved my radio chart in his face. This map had only one airport in this vicinity. I wasn't going to let these soldiers uh, frighten me. At least I wasn't going to let them know how scared I was. But the officer refused to point out my position and pushed the map out to me. Come with me, madam. Turn your plane around and follow me. I started the engine and with men pulling and pushing on both wing struts, turned the plane around. We made a strange looking possession of trucks, men and airplane as we slowly moved in the opposite direction. I was surrounded on all sides by soldiers. I suspected I had been headed into an area that they did not want me to see. I decided it would be very wise to keep my eyes straight ahead until they told me to turn. When we reached an oriental looking squarish building, the men showed me where to park the airplane and I climbed out. Two of the soldiers sat down underneath the plane. I don't know whether they were guarding Charlie for me or from me. As soon as she got out of the plane and had a chance to talk, she tried to explain that it was very important that she call Cairo Airport because they were expecting her and they'd be worried if she didn't arrive. She also wanted to make sure she didn't disappear like Amelia. The officer just kept walking, ignoring her as if he couldn't understand English. But she needn't have worried. Cairo was already calling and explaining who she was, and the tower men and her NAA observers, the press and large crowds of people were all waiting for her. Everyone just sat around and visited with her, offering her tea and cider. The officer asked if she could fly at night, and she said, oh yes. So hours later, when it was quite dark, the commander announced, Okay, madam, now you may go to Cairo. When Jerry asked where she was and how to get to Cairo, the commander just said to follow him. The, plane, the men guarding the plane were told to push Charlie down the taxiway to a large runway. Finally, when the plane was placed to his satisfaction, he explained, Now, madam, you take off down this runway. It's the wrong runway, but you use this one anyway. When you get into the air about a thousand feet, you will see lights to an airport on your left. Don't land. Military. But on your right, you will see the lights to another airport. Land. That's Cairo. After carefully pre-flighting the plane, Jerry fastened her seatbelt and shook hands all around. They all smiled and the commander invited her to hurry back. She assured them she had enjoyed her visit and would like to return but with permission. She had landed on a secret base. The Russian, there was actually a Russian missile base being fronted by the Egyptians. Almost sounds like today, doesn't it? At about a thousand feet, she saw Cairo, called the tower, made an approach to runway five, and was cleared to land. It was two hours before all the necessary red tape was finished and she could leave the airport. The date was April 1st, and she called this her April Fool's Day landing. <laughs> she got to uh, rest and ride a camel the next day. And then Cairo to Duran, April 3rd, 100, 1,173 statute miles, 8 hours and 14 minutes. Up at 3.30 in the morning, heading to the airport, Everything went smoothly until Jerry came to the immigration man. When he had found that Jerry had no airline ticket, he refused to stamp her passport. He said, lady, go get a ticket. When she didn't back up, he got very cross. 
Get out of here, lady. I am busy. Go buy a ticket. Finally, she, with the help of somebody else who knew the language, she was able to convince him that Charlie did not need a ticket, and she was able to take off. After she'd been flying for a while, she noticed that things were beginning to look fuzzy. Slowly, she began to realize that she had flown into one of the sandstorms that she had been warned about. Eventually, the swirling winds did settle down, but not until she was within a half hour of Tehran. As she neared Duran Airport, Jerry gave a little sigh of relief that she had made it across Arabia without even one pot shot from those nomads who like to do a little target practice when a plane goes by. Later, her husband told her it was just because they knew it was a woman and they did not want to waste the ammunition. <laughs> oh well. Jerry decided that the Duran Airport must be the most beautiful one in the world with its marble columned terminal. Several hundred white-robed people were crowded on the broad steps of the terminal, waiting to see the first flying housewife to venture into this part of the world. As she climbed out of the plane, they saw, of course, from her blue skirt, she must truly be a woman, and they set up a shout of applause. Apparently, not much exciting happens to hear, and she was something unusual. The men were curious. The only women there were American wives. From the time of the Prophet Muhammad, Arabian women had been hidden by all but their immediate families. They could not see or be seen by the outside world. To show one's face was a great sin. For a woman to drive a car in Arabia at that time was not only wanton, but permitted, prohibited by law under penalty of her husband being put in jail. So you know they didn't do it. Even European and American women could not drive. So the men were very puzzled. Probably no one had thought to make a law that a woman couldn't drive an airplane. And somehow they just thought, well, it couldn't be happening. Although they were interested in seeing Jerry, they talked to her, then they'd look at the plane. Then they talked to her, and they'd look at the plane. And she finally realized they were waiting for the pilot. They, she thought, that they thought she had a man hidden in the plane behind the fuel tanks. So, well, you see, out of pictures that there was no way. So finally, one of the men went over and he looked and he could see that there was one seat and the rest was all fuel tank. And he said, there was no man. Well, this brought a really rousing ovation. Duran to Karachi, Pakistan, April 4th, 1,063 miles, flight time, seven hours, 38 minutes. About an hour out of Karachi, an airline pilot called her on the VHF radio. Karachi was requesting she name her occupation. She thought it was a strange question, but answered, housewife. Karachi to Delhi, April 5th, 665 miles, four and a half hours. She looked forward to a short, pleasant flight. After about six hours at the airport, the paperwork was finally finished and the paint cast and ready to go. At Palam, she was met by the usual crowd of pressmen and officials. One of them had met Amelia Earhart when she landed there in 1937. Delhi to Calcutta, April 6th, 817 miles, five and a half hours. This was a short and easy flight. Had an interesting day of sightseeing and visiting with the Indian people. Calcutta to Bangkok. April 7th, 999 miles, flight time seven and a half hours. Again, up at 3.30 to get an early start. She flew over the Bay of Bengal and the Burmese coast and landed in Bangkok. It was extremely hot. Since she never knew for sure when she would be at a particular city, she had not made hotel reservations. On this day, all the best hotels were filled and she had to settle for a second-rate room. There was also a shortage of water in Bangkok at this time, and there was no water at her hotel, and the air conditioning didn't work. She had a great dinner, though, shark's fin soup and abalone stew. Her idea of a great meal is not like, exactly like mine. Bangkok to Manila, April 8th, 1,365 miles, 12 hours, 19 minutes, sitting in that little plane. 3.30 wake up time again. She got off the ground about eight o'clock Bangkok time. The cloud cover was heavy, so she had to fly an instrument flight plan. As Jerry flew by the airport in Saigon, 
They approached controller and called her and wanted to know if she had a man on board. She answered negative, no man on board. His reply was, well, good luck. <laughs> she was flying along peacefully for about an hour and gradually became aware that Charlie's engine didn't sound right. It was running rough. Something was wrong. Suddenly she knew what the trouble was, dirt. She remembered the stories she'd heard about the things the desert sandstorms did to engines. When she turned the carburetor heat on, air from an alternate source could get to the engine, allowing it to run better. But this way, the engine used more fuel. This could get bad. She was terribly thirsty, but didn't dare drink the rest of the water in her flask. She might need it if she had to spend days floating around in a life raft. She said a lot of prayers. She wrote an article for Guy Post magazine about my flight through, tater, through fear. But less than an hour later, she approached Lubang, landed safely. A large crowd of people surrounded her, asking questions before she could get out of the plane. And uh, Charlie's new antenna motor was finally installed, and the brakes were replaced. Again, they had to remove the gas tanks in order to do this. She explained to the men, and they said, oh no, they could take care of all this. But when they, after they installed, the, now remember there were three fuel tanks. There was the main one and then two others. She had to use every drop of gasoline from the first tank before she could flip the switch to get to the second tank. And then again, when it was time for the third tank, you used every drop of gasoline and then switch. She decided she better just double check the insulation. And it's a good thing she did because the hose from the first to the second tank had not been installed properly and she would have run out of gas over the ocean. Like I say, she was very careful, very, and it's a good thing she was because it never would have worked. Manila to Guam, April 8th, 1600 miles, 11 hours, 39 minutes. Takeoff went smoothly after the usual amount of paperwork. The engine now sounded good, and Jerry was anxious to explore the fast Pacific. She was heading home. The flight was uneventful, and Jerry landed at 8.05 Guam time. Someone opened the door to the plane, and a band started playing. An excited crowd greeted her with, Welcome back to the United States. Guam to Wake, April 12th, 1,500 miles, 12 and a half hours. Another 3.30 wake up. Everything went quickly because she had counted a minimum of red tape. Her official takeoff time was 5.30 a.m. The weather was good, the long flight went smoothly, and she made a good landing at Wake Island, which has a diameter of only 15 miles. A miss of, miss of one degree would make her miss her mark by 30 miles. Not bad for a novice pilot. The airport was packed with several hundred people where she was greeted with cheers, hugs, and lays. April 13th, Wake Island. Finally, she got to sleep in and relax that day. This was her favorite place. Her takeoff time was scheduled for 10.30 p.m. This leg would take about 16 hours, so she decided to fly at night and arrive in Honolulu while it was still daylight. As she taxied out to the end of the runway, Jerry couldn't help remembering the story that one of the men had told her. It was about a legendary shark named Mag Check Charlie, who was supposed to swim around the island, living off the remains of unlucky aviators. <laughs> According to the story, he's a very smart shark and he has good ears. When a pilot takes his plane to the end of the runway to check the engine magnetos before takeoff, Mag Check Charlie listens carefully to see if an engine sounds rough. If he detects a rough magneto or anything that seems unusual, he swims to the far end of the runway to await his dinner. <laughs> the men had been having fun and had watched her expression carefully as she answered, Well, Charlie has a smooth engine and I'm not worried, but it's nice to know I won't be alone out there in the dark. <laughs> when she assured herself that the Cessna's engine was as smooth as she had claimed, she told ground control that 3A Charlie is ready for takeoff. Wake to Honolulu, 2,345 miles, flight down, 15 hours, 46 minutes. I'm sure many of you have taken flights in airplanes. 
Some of you probably have flown across the ocean. But the flight attendant said, are you ready for dinner? Would you like a drink? The restroom's fore and aft? Well, no. Picture her in that plane. Honolulu was easy to find, though. Jerry called for her and got clears to land. A big crowd greeted her. Almost immediately, she was called to the phone. It was Russ. He told her about all the luau's and other parties that had been arranged for her and then canceled because he told the people she would be tired and she would need sleep. She was furious. The first picture, she's happy. You could see the second one. No. She was furious. She said, but I'm not tired now, not, not, now that I'm here. How could you ruin things for me before I even got here? Someone from Cessna was scheduled to look after the plane, and she was again told of the parties that had been canceled at her husband's insistence. Everyone would respect her wishes and leave her alone. She was taken to a hotel where the desk clerk assured her that she would not be disturbed. She ended up having dinner by herself. And I don't think she ever forgave us for that. <laughs> April 14th, Honolulu to Oakland, 2,409 miles, 17 hours, 38 minutes. It was after 5 p.m. before she was ready to taxi out to the runway. Before leaving home, she worried about flying all night, fearing that she might fall asleep. She even practiced trying to sit up all night in a chair at home. Well, that didn't work. She always fell asleep. But she discovered that the excitement made it possible for her to do things that otherwise she couldn't have done. Oxygen helped her to stay alert. At least once an hour, she put on an oxygen mask for a period of 10 to 15 minutes. She got calls from ships and Air Force planes, and that helped to pass the time. When Oakland International Airport came in sight, Jerry had been flying almost 18 hours. But she didn't feel tired. Just wonderful to be almost home. She touched down to an enormous throng of people. They seemed almost as excited as she was. Russ had flown to Oakland to, to meet her. Um, Oakland to Tucson, April 16th, 746 miles, 5 hours, 36 minutes. Jerry took off at Tucson to refuel. It was good to be flying in America again. She spent the night at an airport hotel, leaving a wake-up call for 4.30. April 17th, home. From Tucson, she flew to El Paso, landing at 7.45. She had not been expecting anyone but her NAA observers, but as usual, there was a crowd of people. They had all kinds of things planned for her, but she couldn't stay. A storm front was moving across her path, and if she didn't hurry, she might be grounded for a few days. After another quick refueling stop at Bowling Green, she headed for Columbus. I get a little emotional. I was there. And as I read her book and, and, and give my talks, I can say I get a little emotional. More than 5,000 people were waiting for her landing at Fort Columbus. Of course, we at the family were all there. Governor Rose, Mayor Sensenbrenner, Congressman Sam Devine, Air Force generals, and a deputy of the FAA with a telegram from President Johnson inviting her to the White House. It was so exciting and I'll never forget it. Like I say, it almost feels like I'm still there, like I was with her in that plane. Too bad I was only 23 years old. We won't talk about the age today. <laughs> but it was about 60 years ago. <laughs> <coughs> Jerry never flew the spirit of Columbus again. Uh, Charlie is at the Smithsonian in Washington. And uh, this, at, at a newly opened Smithsonian and National Air and Space Museum. This is called the Thomas W. Haas We All Fly Gallery. Her plane will anchor the theme for general aviation. Quite an honor. She went on to do lots more flying, setting 21 aviation records in other planes. But in this plane, um, she had many significant folks. First, many were still stand. First to fly the Pacific in a single engine plane. First to fly the Pacific from west to east. First to fly the Atlantic and the Pacific. First to fly the Pacific in both directions. First woman to do any of this. 
She received more than 100 citations and, and so forth, including one presented to her at the White House by President Johnson. She was a true aviation pioneer. Her flight is considered technically more challenging than Lindbergh's and obviously more successful than Amelia's. She proved that an everyday housewife could conquer the world. She had fun and always had the confidence that it was going to work out. Her experiences were life-changing. There's a 1960s brochure entitled Ohio Gave Flight to the World, where Jerry is featured, along with our cousins, the Wright brothers, astronaut John Glenn and Eddie Rickenbacker. In 1970, she was recognized by the Columbus Citizen Journal as Outstanding Sportswoman of the Year. And in 1981, she was inducted into the Licking County Hall of Fame. <coughs> September 14th, a life, uh, September 14th of 2013, a life-size statue of Jerry was dedicated to at the Works, which is our local newer museum where Jerry and I grew up. Also that year, she was honored as one of 20 outstanding uh, women in Ohio. Um, Jerry and Annie Oakley were awarded that together. On April 17, 2014, the 50th anniversary of her flight, a similar statue of her was dedicated at the Columbus Airport, now John Glenn International Airport. It is located near the Delta Gate. And if you see the statue, behind that on the wall is a big show case, show case showing all kinds of pictures and memorabilia. I hope you get to see it. She passed away at her home on September 30th, 2014, at the age of 88. Two weeks later, on October 13th, she was inducted into the Columbus Hall of Fame. December 17, 2015, she was inducted into the First Flight Society at the Wright Brothers Memorial in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Uh, June 18, 19, 2016, uh, we opened another display of Jerry at the Works, our museum, including an airplane that looks identical to the one that Jerry flew. Uh, Wendy, and, and Dale are the ones who are so instrumental in, in arranging for this plane and getting that all settled in. It looks exactly like Jerry's, and you can sit in the seat of the plane. And if you go, I ask you, please, sit in the seat. Because it's one thing to say, she flew around the world in an airplane like this. But when you sit in that seat, surrounded by these fake fuel tanks, you think, oh my God, she flew across the ocean in this little plane. On September 24th, 2022, this past September, Jerry was inducted into the National Aviation Hall of Fame this at the Air Force Museum in Dayton. I was there to represent her and was given the, the medal, and I was told that when I talk about her, I can wear this, and I do with great, great honor. It was so thrilling to be there with, with all these fantastic, wonderful people. Jerry said, you don't have to be rich to follow a dream. Rich, you just have to be rich in inspiration and in courage. By the way, she never became rich, not money-wise. In fact, for two years, she traveled around the country giving speeches to earn money to pay back many of her sponsors. Anything today, she would be extremely wealthy. She inspired many other women to reach their dreams, including some who became pilots, while living in Florida, she met Shasta Wyez, a young girl from Afghanistan who was a, a, a private pilot uh, and the first woman from Afghanistan to get that. But Jerry inspired her to be the first woman from Afghanistan and at that time the youngest to fly around the world, which she did in 2017. As a young girl, Jerry always had the dream of becoming a pilot and flying around the world. She said, and I quote, I hope that somewhere here and there, just doing my, just my doing something that hasn't been done will encourage someone else who wants to do something very much and hasn't quite had the courage to do it. Shortly after her return, I was at a party at her home. 
Brigadier General Robert Strauss, commander of Lockburn's 801st Division, made an amusing comparison of her exploit with the routine flights of the SAC bombers. Every week our planes fly in the ocean, he paused and said, but with the help of three men and six engines. <laughs> One of the men commented that Amelia had flown a new twin-engine Lockheed airplane, but she'd only flown an 11-year-old seat single engine Cessna with a paint job? Yes, Amelia had had a lot of experience, even flying over the ocean to Ireland. But Jerry had only flown over water to get to the Bahamas. And yes, Amelia even had a navigator with her. So how, how could she explain her success over Amelia? Hmm. She paused and said, well, I was smart enough not to take a man along to navigate. <laughs> Because Cessna wanted Charlie, so it could be donated to the Smithsonian, they gave her a plane, uh, a Cessna 2000, 200, yeah, Cessna 206. She set a lot of aviation records with that plane also. Uh, but flying is very expensive, and she soon realized that she could not afford to keep the plane. Even the cost of gasoline was horrendous. But she knew of an organization called the Flying Padres. She gave her plane to one of the flying priests who had a territory of several thousand miles in New Guinea. She delivered the plane and spent a month there having a great time. She danced with reformed cannibals and visited a leper colony. Jerry said, you don't have to be rich to follow a dream. You remember, just pitch an inspiration. I hope you've enjoyed this little flight around the world with my sister. Um, I think of her every day, and I, I still marvel at the courage that she had and, and the ability. Um, thank you for listening. You're a great audience.